Darren Wolf, and he will be speaking on gun rights. So I'll leave it to Darren. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out. And thank you to Democracy Unplugged. Thank you. Martin. And um, I was hoping to be able to thank people for bringing some guns, but it doesn't look like anybody did. So. It's concealed. Uh, oh, okay. Well, thank you. A special thank you to everybody who brought their guns for keeping us safer here tonight. <laughs> uh, a fundamental question here is, uh, is self-defense a right or a privilege granted by politicians? See, uh, <clears throat> no issue can be looked at in a vacuum. And therefore, the gun issue, like with any other issue, we have to look at <clears throat> basic uh, principles and moral implications. And that means looking at that one moral imperative that drives us in all human relationships, the non-aggression principle. It is immoral to initiate the use of force or the threat of force against peaceful people. So somebody has to be actually engaging in violence or aggressive behavior or very, threat, very credibly threatening to do so before one can use force in self-defense or in retaliation. So what does that have to do with guns? Well, the mere possession of an inanimate object, such as a gun, and yes, even a full auto belt fed, yes, yeah. nice piece, right? Um, <laughs> aggresses against no one. So there is no uh, moral justification for taking guns away from people who adhere to the non aggression principle, since that would involve the initiation of force to separate these people from their weapons. Now, property rights are part of the equation also. People have a right to their property, guns are property. So, if we're going to you know, separate uh, people from their weapons using force, we are stealing those weapons. And I'm sure that everybody here will agree that theft is immoral, right? Now, there is a moral justification for, uh, at times, using force, and that is self-defense. Because if the uh, initiation of force is immoral, uh, the right to self-defense seems obvious. So. Using, you know, separating people from their weapons or taking their guns is uh, depriving them of the ability to use defensive force. And this is really just another way that gun control is a violation of people's rights. Now, before anybody says, uh, yeah, that sounds very nice in theory, but doesn't work out in the real world, let's take a look at how this plays out in the real world. <clears throat> To talk about all the tyrannical governments that have killed, tortured, enslaved, uh, what else have they done? Uh, exiled, stolen from, raped, all these things. To talk about that would take more than the whole two hours we have allotted to this whole event. Gun control is, in reality, people control. Going back to some actually very racist roots. For example, in Maryland, the law once read, and no Negro or other slave uh, within this province shall be permitted to carry any gun or any other offensive weapon. In Nazi Germany, the law once read, Jews are prohibited from acquiring, possessing, and carrying firearms and ammunition, as well as truncheons or stabbing weapons. So uh, whether it was not allowing African Americans to have guns in here, or not allowing Jews to have guns in Nazi Germany, the intent is the same, is to have disarmed victims incapable of resistance. Now, <clears throat> in the bloody 20th century, Mao Zedong summed it up very nicely. He said, political power grows out of the barrel of the gun. Says, Governments want disarmed victims. This is what Mao had in mind, and there are over 70 million dead Chinese to prove it. And they're only a part of the over 200 million people murdered by governments during the 20th century. Every major genocide was committed by a government that implemented some kind of gun control. So this is why there's never a good time to talk about disarming the people. What the conversation should be about is disarming the government. There's some gun control I can get behind. That's right. 
So there's a, there's a massive imbalance between the power of the government, which is way up here, and the power of the people, which is way down there. Uh, not only the military, but law enforcement in this country are overwhelmingly strong. So what we need to do is start shifting that power away from the government by putting these functions back in the hands of the people where they belong. One of the lesser known founders and anti-federalists by the name of Tench Cox explained it well. He was actually picking up on the same theme as Mao when he wrote, Who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? He said, Is it feared then that we shall turn our arms, each man against his own bosom? Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust in God, it will ever remain in the hands of the people. There's only one way to guarantee our lives and liberties. That is to be stronger than those who seek to take them are. And as an example in relatively modern times of armed people standing up for their rights, I would offer the deacons for defense and justice. They started out in 1964 in Jonesboro, Louisiana, and they ended up having 21 chapters across the Deep South. And even though they never numbered more than a few hundred men, they've been credited with saving the civil rights movement from destruction by the Klan and law enforcement. Today, gun control is held to be a matter of reducing crime and keeping society safer. Uh, I think that the first half of my presentation has uh, laid to rest the idea that gun control will keep us safer from the government. But when it comes to crime, there are two facts that the advocates of gun control really can't overcome. If one is going to argue that the availability of guns is the problem, then how do you, do you explain that for the last 20 years, overall, nationwide, we've been seeing a reduction in the murder rate and in crime rates? So, and at the same time, we're seeing rates of gun ownership higher than ever. There are more guns than, out in society than ever, yet we've seen 20 years of a, of, um, of a reduction in the murder rate. Or another way to put it, as gun control has receded, so has crime. As gun rights are more respected, crime has receded, however you want to look at it that way. I don't think this can be overcome. Additionally, how would any advocates of gun control explain that in days gone by, so even going back into the 19th century, when you could mail order guns with no background check and no registration, there was less crime and less murder. If gun registration and uh, background checks is supposed to be some big solution, why did we have less crime when we didn't have these things? <clears throat> One issue that uh, comes up is uh, basically a statistics war when you're trying to talk about crime and guns. And, um, well, the statistics war gets very interesting because you have a, a, a study is produced, and then the study is debunked, and then the debunking is debunked, and we need to cut through all this nonsense. When it comes to crime, there really is no 100% definitive statistical proof either way. And one problem is, of course, interpreting statistics. Sometimes there is deliberate statistical manipulation. Sometimes there is an honest misunderstanding of what one is looking at. Now, let me give an example. Uh, at the outset of uh, Chicago's 1982 handgun ban until 2007, Chicago's murder rate averaged 17% less than before this, the, uh, the handgun ban that they put in. So, a lot of anti-gun people will look at a number like that and say, hey, you see, you see, gun control works. It reduced the murder rate. Now, but wait a minute. During that same period, 82 to 2007, the national murder rate averaged 25% less than before Chicago's handgun ban. So Chicago actually lagged behind the rest of the country in reducing its murder rate. So what I would say is that even in the face of a falling murder rate, we see the failure of gun control. Chicago didn't keep up with the rest of the country. The reason for that is, basically, that every year, two million crimes are prevented by people that point or brandish guns at criminals, not fire them, but deter the crime. Chicagoans were denied the ability to do this, and they suffered for it. 
Now, one way that we can actually reduce the murder rate, because after all, the murder rate is not just about the availability of guns. One way we can reduce the murder rate is to end the war on drugs. This is from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition's website. And it specifically talks about how, well, here, let me just read it. One obvious solution to rampant gun violence has often been downplayed or overlooked, ending drug prohibition. Further down, it reads, uh, as members representing the full spectrum of opinion on gun control, we know that reducing gun violence has little to do with either gun control or gun rights. Just as during the prohibition on alcohol, the murder rate was high and it immediately went down upon repeal, we can repeal the war on drugs today and see a reduction in crime. <clears throat> now, some people say we don't need guns because the police will protect us. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, they should reconsider that point of view. Uh, the police have no legal obligation to protect anybody. This has been affirmed by the courts in cases such as Warren v. District of Columbia and Ford v. Town of Grafton. In the latter case, Catherine Ford was actually advised by the police to get a gun to protect herself from her ex-husband. She ignored this advice. She ended up shot and paralyzed. The police know they can't protect us. Uh, we should know better, too. Now, sometimes um, anti-gun people like to point to certain parts of Europe and their lower murder rates to say, hey, look, gun control is working for them. And here they ignore some rather inconvenient facts. Uh, for example, countries like Finland and Switzerland have very high rates of gun ownership, but yet very low murder rates, especially Switzerland. And there are a number of European countries that have very strict gun control and very high murder rates. Uh, uh, Russia leads the sad pack with the murder rate four times higher than the US and there's strict gun control left over from the Soviet days. And that's actually an improvement from recent years. <coughs> the murder rate used to be even higher. Uh, other European countries with higher murder rates in the United States include Estonia, Belarus, uh, Lithuania, the Ukraine, Moldova. Also bear in mind that when the UK banned handguns in 1997, their murder rate went up. And go down and went up. Uh, while obviously not in Europe, the Australians had the same experience with their handgun ban. The murder rate went up. No doubt a gun ban here will raise the US murder rate. One only need look at Chicago to see that. Now, while we're looking around the world, it, it's worth noting, uh, the slide just talks about Brazil, but it's worth noting that there are a lot of countries that have higher murder rates in the US. So I printed out a list of countries and I ended the list with the United States. So here's a list of countries that have a murder rate higher than the US. You go down the first page and then you go all the way down the second page and you find the US over there. So there are hundreds or so countries that have higher murder rates than the United States. All, all the noise about how dangerous it is here, notwithstanding, the truth is the U.S. murder rate is below the world average. And this is an important point. The United States is not a particularly dangerous place. Our murder rate is below the world average. So let me emphasize, there is no case for gun control. The moral arguments dictate that we not initiate the use of force to disarm peaceful people. The statistical evidence argues against it, but especially the history of tyrannical and murderous governments. Now, a people that are armed and organized to defend themselves are safer people. Well, let me close with a little test. Let me see how effective my talk has been tonight. <laughs> So, all in favor of gun control, <laughs> raise your right hand. <laughs> Nobody, ah. Oh, I'm a left-hander. Y'all are. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I guess now it's time to work. Ah, Mr. Uh, yeah, um, I, I'll hear you on the gun control. 
Um, what are you actually advocating yourself for in terms of gun ownership? Um, any age restrictions? Any restrictions as to what kind of weapon you can own? Uh, what, what's your feeling? Can you be a six-year-old with a machine gun? Is that okay? <laughs> Well, it's, let, let's, let me break down the question, okay? Uh, as far as adults are concerned, of course, I would say you can own anything you want. So that's over 18. Well, there again, it, it depends on how you want to regulate guns. I see this as being more a matter of parenting than of law. I think sometimes there's too much of a reliance on law. Because I don't I get a straight answer. Or a I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to answer you. Uh, maybe it's more complicated than, than your understanding, but here's the answer. Instead of saying law, it's going to be 18, it's going to be 21, I think it's a matter of parents regulating the guns that their children have. There's nothing wrong with taking a 12-year-old out to a range and shooting. There used to be a time in this country and in Pennsylvania where kids would take their hunting rifles to school, put them in the locker, and go hunting after school. This used to happen and nobody got killed. Uh, what I'm asking about is basically, I mean, can you be a 14-year-old in Chester and take a gun to school? Is that okay with you? If the school wants to prohibit it, that's fine with me. I, I'm, again, I'm trying to distinguish between law and, say, parenting or rules that different institutions might have. Uh, if, um, if an apartment complex wants to have people sign leases that say that they can't have any guns, that's fine. Well, how about the public street then? Sorry? Public street. I mean, can you be 14 year old and walking around with a gun on the public street? Is that okay with you? That's a pretty simple question. Is that legal? Would that would you be comfortable with that being legal? Hmm. I'm not making a judgment one way or the other. I'm yeah. just trying to get your opinion. Well, to get, that gets in really deep because I'm personally not a believer in the idea that there should be public streets. I would say private property, privatize everything. Are you so I'm a right? little bit like, <laughs> well, you're asking me how to run a system that I don't like, I don't agree with, and I want to get rid of. Well, it's a real world out yeah. there. Come on. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. public street. Well, what's your answer? Can you be 14 and have a gun on the street? How about a simple plain answer? Um, how about we talk about whether 14-year-olds really want to carry machine guns uh, anyways? Automatic an weapons are not a crime problem. Handguns are. This is a red herring it's trying to take me somewhere. into an area that it doesn't apply to the real world. But you want to talk about a real world problem? Let's try to get about handguns. Now you're trying to put up a red herring to no, trip no, no, me no. up. That's a fair question. And no, it's a Chester. red herring to try to trip me up. You live in Chester and you're 16. I mean, there's a lot of 16-year-olds in Chester that carry a gun and want to carry a gun. Yes, because and it's, it's a real war on drugs. If you repeal the war on drugs, you take care of so many of these gang and crime problems. That's the answer. Yes. If I lived in Chester and my daughter was 13 years old, or 14 years old, or 12 years old, and for some reason, I'm so irresponsible that I let her walk around in Chester uh, without an adult. You damn right, I want her to have a gun. Yep. Absolutely, freaking yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> who, who would who would That's want right. their daughter to be defenseless in a in a in a pit of crime like that? Yeah. Right. So, do you think that there's maybe people are lacking a moral responsibility, or just kind of like you know gun safety in general? Because then they used to have uh, teach people how to shoot like guns in, in, in school back in like the 1800 or something? Yeah, I'm not sure what the question is. Oh, uh, um, just wanted to see your opinion. Like, are, are, do you think people are lacking a responsibility when it comes to gun ownership? Maybe to people, you know, like that 14 year old was actually taught, you know, gun responsibility, then people might be safer, or you might be safer carrying that. I certainly have an agreement with gun safety, if that's what you're asking yeah. me. Uh, when it comes to morality, I think uh, it goes back to the non-aggression principle I talked about. That's really not understood or taught. Um, there's a lot of aggression that goes on that, is, uh, that people attempt to justify. Things such as taxation and regulation and laws against possessing things. I see that as a moral issue. Any other questions? Yes. Do you think that the legal implications of uh, age group or, uh, say, certain regulations, so if, if the, the law itself, whether it's legal or not, to do something, do you think that really has much to do with people carrying guns, owning them, brandishing them? 
as far as legislation and gun control, legislation that's passed, do you feel do you feel that that changes the amount of guns on the street? Well, certainly yes. Um, if you if guns are illegal and you, you have strict enforcement, you're going to reduce the number of guns, at least in the uh, good people's hands. Mm -hmm. uh, the criminals, it's hard to say. You know, uh, like I use the example of Brazil, it's known that their rate of gun ownership, legal gun ownership, is very low. But yet, they're killing each other much more than they're in here. I don't know if I answered the question. I'm not sure I completely understood it. But anyway. Yeah, I was just curious if you think that the law has any actual implication as to the number of guns on the street in terms of... Oh, I think, all right. So you know that basically the recipe of gun control works to reduce... Yeah. The, the do, do, do you feel that any type of gun legislation has led to, say, a 14-year-old, in his example, 14-year-old child walking the street who happens to be a part of a gang in Chester that got it from whatever means that is illegal? Do you think that there's any legislation that can be passed that's going to really change that? Not if you're going to do things like have the war on drugs going on that drives people into you know criminal gangs and things like that. They can get their illegal guns. But not only that, uh, there are countries that uh, have high rate, high murder rates that don't have to do with guns. Uh, matter of fact, the U.S. has a non-gun murder rate that's higher than the, the total murder rate of some countries. So we could actually eliminate all the guns, and we would still have a murder rate higher than a lot of countries out there. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, recently, uh, I think it was Philadelphia tried to pass a uh, <clears throat> thing about Saturday night specials, but uh, the state said no, it wasn't within their purview. So it leads me to the question, <clears throat> even assuming that you don't like <clears throat> gun regulations per se, but who should have the final say on this? Like city, state, federal? Uh, how, in other words, how would you do that? And B, let's say you were elected the first libertarian state senator in Pennsylvania. What kind of legislation would you sponsor or repeal? Repeal. I like that one. <laughs> uh, well, the federal constitution talks about what now? Um, uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of, the, of, uh, of a free state, the right to what to bear arms should not be abridged. Uh, the Pennsylvania constitution talks about the right to, uh, to bear arms shall not be questioned. So um, if we're going to actually obey the law, the law is absolute, clear, and there's really no, I don't see why there's any question about it other than people want to ignore constitutions to uh, implement agendas that uh, go against them. So the, I mean, the constitutions of both the state and at the federal level are very clear. We can have guns. Yes? So why, after you presented such a logical argument, why would anyone want gun control? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Since I don't want gun control, I can't answer that, but I think it's a great question. Yes. In the 1970s, high schools in Delaware County had rifle teams, which the students participated in. Can you comment and positive and negative thoughts on bringing those things back, with, um, notwithstanding any argument on public school systems and such? Yeah, no, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's great. Uh, you know, they, they, I think one thing I don't want is to force guns on anybody. Just as much as I don't want to force people to, to, to not have them, I don't want to force guns on people. So certainly people who want to shoot and want to do that, I think they should be free to do so. And I think it's a good idea to train the kids on uh, gun safety and you, the use of guns. Yes? Who should pay for that uh, safety uh, gun training? Should it be the uh, public school system that's underfunded? Should it be the city government where gun violence is a, uh, perceived as a problem, or should it be uh, the person who, uh, the vendor who sells the, uh, the gun? Who should be responsible for training people on how to use them? The rich. The rich? The rich? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that either. You know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it's true. <laughs> well, that actually goes to Bill's point about not, not uh, talking about like, you know, whether there should be a public school system or not. I, my, personally, yeah, I'm, I'm against the whole idea of public schools, so I'm like, they had asked me to have a run of public schools, which would pay for 
doing something in a public school, I'm kind of like, why don't we move to a system of private education? So I'm not really sure how to answer that. Well, if yeah. taking your premise that uh, the public should not pay for it, uh, then should it be the private entrepreneur who sells the gun that should be responsible for training uh, people on how to use them? I don't think that uh, I'm going to legally assign, you know, a duty like you're going to pay for this. What about a moral duty? A moral duty, yes. Anybody who has a gun and wants to wants to own one definitely has a moral duty to know how to use it and yeah. to yeah. be yeah. safe with it. Absolutely. The so, individual. Yeah, so who does right. the training? Of you? I, I've never owned a gun or fired one. I have fired them and I enjoy it. Yep. But I'm not good at it. Okay. So I own a gun. And uh, I take it out and uh, I start uh, shooting at cans. I maybe had a few beers and um, I, I killed somebody. Uh, who's respond Is that just my responsibility or should I have been trained on how to buy I use it before I got it? No, that's your responsibility. It's my responsibility Absolutely. only. Yes. That's yes. 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 your fault for drinking and taking yeah. shooting. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Switzerland, where they have, they encourage, or I don't know if they legally enforce people to uh, keep assault weapons. The United States has had, and I think still currently does, a program where the government provides the sur surplus old uh, M1 Durands to people, and uh, they get training in how to use them. And I believe the op the objective would be to, uh, to have a citizenry that's capable of defending the country. Like yeah. I like to I like to comment on, on one thing. When people talk about gun control and like kids carrying guns and whatever the point is, I think you have to balance uh, one thing against another. I talked about 200 million people killed in the 20th century by governments. So you can easily say, well, if we took all the guns off the street, we would you know save. If we saved one life, isn't that what they say? If we save one life, it's worth doing this, that, and the other. But you have to balance that against, well, how many people will die if they don't have guns? Two million crimes every year prevented by people that have guns. How many of them would be killed if they didn't have guns? Versus having guns in society, a certain number of people are going to be killed. Taking guns out of society, or at least making them illegal, so many other people will be killed. This needs to be looked at in a balanced sense. It's not all or nothing one way. I guess I've been cut off, so thank you. <laughs>